So, I've got my engine back. It's been at Scholar Engineering in Suffolk, where everything's been chemically cleaned, the block has been decked, and the bores have been honed out, and a little bit of work's been done on the head, but you'll see that in time. So today, I'm gonna to be assembling the bottom end. So first, I'm gonna get everything nice and clean as these journals and this mate and face need to be oil free. So I'm just gonna use a bit of brake cleaner and a rag. Now we had to make sure this bit is nice and oil free as we're gonna be installing the new journal bearings and they don't want anything behind them. No oil, no assembly paste, anything. Because we're gonna to have to check the size of them. Now I have purchased some ACL Racing main cap bearings and there are two. That is the top one which goes into the block and this is the bottom one that goes on the main cap. They are quite noticeably different as the one that goes in the block has got the hole in it which matches up with our oil hole there. To put these in, you line up the tab with the cutout in the block. And then this side, push this way. Now make sure they're both sitting exactly level with the bottom of the block. So you shouldn't be able to feel a lip at all. Now I'm gonna grab my main cap. The same principles apply, make sure it's nice and clean. Make sure you've got the right bearing and it also has a tab and a cutout to do exactly the same. And then pop it on the block make sure both mating surfaces are nice and clean and remember which way round it goes as they have markings on them this will need a little bit of persuasion to close the gap up then I'm gonna grab the bolts just put a little bit of oil on them them in and then torque them down in the correct sequence so if you are using the standard bolts it's 34 newton meters and then 62 newton meters now that torqued down this is what it's gonna sit like in the engine now I'm going to measure this using a telescopic bore measuring device and then compare it to a micrometer and the crank. So the crank has had a nice clean and everything's checked over but at the minute we're measuring this front journal here. It's pretty easy to do, just grab yourself a micrometer, take it nice and easy until you find the biggest part and then read your measurement off the micrometer. Now that I know that I have got the nice two foul oil gap that I require, I could go ahead and take this main cap back off. I have measured the other four journals and they are exactly what I want. I will in time do another video on how to measure all this stuff yourself properly, but for now, I'm going to put the other four journal bearings in. Now, I'm almost ready for the crank, but first we've got to put in the thrust washers. I've gone for some nice new ACL performance thrust washers. 
So these go at the second to last bearing at towards the back of the engine, one either side. Hang on a minute. So this is actually my sixth engine in this car. The rest have just been absolutely thrashed, starved of oil, bent a rod, blew a piston out of the side, and this is engine number six. So somehow I have got a Mark 2.5 bottom end. I'm not sure how I've done that, but I'm guessing when I bought this engine second hand, someone had already done that. So these are the thrust washers for the Mark 1 and 2 bottom end. They are the thrust washers for the 2.5. Now for some reason, a ACL don't make a aftermarket VVT thrust washer, so I've had to go with the standard ones, but new ones. So to put these on, we're gonna grab a little bit of assembly lube. And again, the same as the journal bearings, just make sure the top is nice and flush. Now we're ready to place the crank into the block, but I want to put a little bit of assembly lube on all the journals, but not on the mating surfaces for the main caps. Now, make sure your crank is super clean when you put this in. Clean out even these little drill marks where they balance the shaft up. Make sure they're all clean. Make sure all of the oil ways are unblocked. Make sure that fluid can pass through it. Be a good idea to blow this all out with an air jet. Now it's time for the main caps. I'm gonna put a little bit extra lube on where the journals sit just before I put them on. Now double check there's no oil or assembly lube on any of the mating surfaces for the main caps. So I'll mop up my little dribble. Now I was very sensible when I took this engine apart and on the main caps I have labeled them all up because these are all supposed to go in to their own homes. to talk down all the main end caps uh, with the standard bolts there's just a two stage tightening 34 newton meters then 62 newton meters Now even though it's a two stage tightening, I do like to go back over them and just make sure they're all still 62 newton meters. Now if this is all done correctly and my tolerances are right, I should be able to spin this by hand. Now, 
Now I know that's all good, it's time to flip her over and concentrate on the pistons and rods. So there are a few reasons why I took this engine out of the car and apart. One was I heard a knock from the bottom end, which I had to investigate. And two, because I was going turbo, I wanted to put a little bit of strength in the bottom end. So I wanted to replace the standard rods, as I've seen it happen to five of my engines now, and with maybe twice the power, it's probably gonna happen again if I keep these stock rods in. And all they like doing is bending under pressure, particularly the low torque side of the engine. They like to bend and make themselves an exit out the side of the block. So, I've purchased myself a set of Max Peden Rods Forged Con Rods. These are a H-beam design, whereas the standard ones are I-beam, so they are stronger in their own ways. As you can see, they are a lot more meaty and made out of different materials. They're a pretty inexpensive option for what I would consider a lot of security for your car. Also, since I saw the scores in the bores, I have decided to replace the rings for, for the piston themselves as well. Welcome back to my temporary workbench. I'm going to start off by disconnecting the piston from the rod. This is slightly different for all the different variations of engines the MX-5 has. For example, the Mark 1 1.6, I think the wrist pin has to be pressed out whereas the Mark II or 2.5, whichever one I've got now, it has a circlip or a spring clip, which you twist out. But there are some where there is a tab cut out of it where you can lever this out. But in my case, I can get a pair of long nose pliers, grip the bit that's protruding in the middle, gently pry it out. Now I should be able to gently push this wrist pin all the way through until it exits the other side. Now they are apart, I want to remove the old piston rings got to be really careful about how you do this as you need to bend the rings up and try not to scratch the piston when you're taking them off but on each of them there is a little gap hold one end grab the other pull it out over the top of the piston and work your way around Make sure the end of the ring doesn't slip back down and scratch the piston. Now at the bottom you have two oil rails and the oil waffle. It's easiest to start with the top oil rail. These are really thin and flimsy, so probably the easiest to remove. Now keep looking around the oil waffle, as there will be two ends that don't look the same as the others. which is right there. For this bit, I will carefully use a little pick. Now to do all the others, but 
on one of them I'm gonna leave one of the oil control rings and I'll show you why I'm doing that in just a bit As you can see, these rings are really brittle and really easy to snap. If you bend them the wrong way or bend them just too much, they will snap. So here's my last piston, still with the oil rail in. Now I'll show you why. So yes, I am using the standard pistons in this engine. Honestly, I didn't actually plan on putting forged rods in it, but I had a few too many on my birthday and ordered them anyway. But I am putting new rings in. I have got a set of Hastings piston rings, as they did offer the standard bore size option, whereas I couldn't manage to get any from Wiseco or Supertech. But we need to gap the rings. By the ring gap, I mean the distance between that end of the ring and that end of the ring when they are in the bore. If the ring gap is too close and it heats up and the ends meet, they will butt up and seize the piston in. If they are too loose, you will lose a little bit of compression and get excessive blow by. There are a couple of ways to gap your piston rings. One is to send them to the machine shop when you have all the machine work done on your block and get them to do it or option two, buy yourself a piston ring grinder and do it yourself. Option three is to get a diamond file and go at it for a while. And all you have to do is take down one edge of the piston ring gap until it meets your requirements. Because I am going boosted, I have chosen a 20 foul ring gap for my top ring, a 22 foul gap for my second ring and the oil control rings don't really need to be gapped at all because they are lower down in the piston they don't see a lot of heat and the waffle itself because of the nature of it that doesn't expand as much to start off I'm going to put a little bit of oil in the bore just so I can slide the rings in nice and easy Now I need to put the ring in the ball. Start off with one end, just in, and then work your way around nice and slowly. Now, some engines at the top of the stroke, as in where the block and the head meet, the balls are slightly tapered. We don't want to measure this at the top, we want to measure it a little bit down. And to do that, and to make sure we get the ring nice and square and flat, we're going to use the piston with the oil ring still intact. To do that, we're going to use the piston with the oil ring still in. But we're going to put this in upside down, like this. Now just push it down until it stops on the oil control ring. Pull the piston back out. Now you can see the gap. We're going to grab our feeler gauges. And I'm going to start off with the 22 foul one and slide it in the gap. Now that's got a little bit of play in it. So I'm going to move to the 23 foul feeler gauge. Nice snug fit. Now I'm going to carefully remove the ring back out. Now doing your ring gaps is specific to every bore. So when you are gapping your first cylinder, 
label them all up, cylinder one, and then grab new rings, move on to cylinder two, so on. Because you cannot get rings using cylinder one for piston number four. Now I know that the piston rings are all gapped properly and my piston is super clean, including all the ring lands, super clean, it's time to install the piston rings themselves. First off, I'm going to put a little bit of oil, not assembly lube, but oil in all of the ring lands. Now the first ring I'm going to put in is the oil waffle plate. I don't think there's a specific way these go in, but the way I took them out is with the ends facing upwards. I'm also going to give this a light coat of oil as well. Now this is the most delicate ring of all of them. So I'm going to do this by hand and be super careful. I'm going to open it up only just enough to go over the piston. And watch out not to scrape it down the sides. Next is the lower oil control ring that goes below the waffle ring. These two are really, really thin, so I'll do this by hand. Give it a light coat of oil first. and then the top oil control ring. There's no difference in between these rings. Now that all the oil control rings are done, it's time for the second compression ring. Now I'm using Hastings piston rings, so they are a little bit different to other makes out there, but the second compression ring has a top and a number on it and on the back and on the back on the inside you may be able to see it's actually chamfered now the compression rings are a lot thicker and a lot tougher than the oil control rings so I won't be able to do these by hand and as you saw earlier these are really fragile and can snap really easily so I'm going to use some piston ring expand pliers. Got little grooves in the end. You just sit the piston rings in there, open them up, only just big enough to go over the piston. And be careful not to scratch anything on the way down. Now for the top one, again I'm using the Hastings rings and there is no difference what way up this one goes. There is no markings, no dots, nothing different about any of the edges. They're all installed, you might think they're a little loose in there, but that is how they are. Now I've seen lots of different people with lots of different opinions and it does matter what rings you now on some rings for example like the Wiseco ones there is a specific orientation all these rings have to go around but what I have done is placed the top ring gap here the second ring gap here the first oil control ring gap there the waffle plate there and the second control ring there. So the gas hasn't got a complete straight line and down into the crank. Now that all the piston rings are on, it's time to marry up the piston with the rod. Now the pistons do have an orientation. They have a dot to indicate the front of the engine because they can't go around the other way as the inlays for the valves 
are different, the intake are larger, and the exhaust are smaller. The rod, however, doesn't have an orientation to go round, but I'm gonna make sure the logo is facing the front, like that. Now, before I go put anything together, I'm gonna to put a healthy amount of assembly lube on everything to make it a little bit easier to put together. Now I'm going to start off the assembly of these two by putting one circle clip in one end. Now make sure it is seated properly in the groove. I've learned this the hard way as the first ever motorbike engine I did rebuild I didn't seat this properly and it ended up welding the piston to the with the circlip nice and straight wedged in here like a woodruff key turn the piston over pop the con rod in roughly line it up and then slide the wrist pin in until it's reached the circlip that you've just put in and then put the other circlip in now they're ready to be put into the block now on the block I'm going to position the crank so that number one and number four are facing downwards. Remember this is upside down at the middle. And then flip the engine back over. So I'm going to start off with piston and rod number one. I'm going to take the cap off of the rod. And I'm going to take note of how this goes back together as on one side of the rod there are numbers and on the other there isn't. It does have to go this way because this is the way it was machined. And I'm going to place the new bearing in the bottom. These are brand new ACL racing bearings and they are the same principle as the main cap bearings. Pop a little bit of assembly lube on that. and again, not on the cap mating surfaces. So you may have remember from the video where I dismantled this engine, that I put a little bit of vacuum tube over the studs that came out of the con rod, but these new forged rods don't have studs, they have bolts. So I'm gonna use a little jiffy bubble wrap bag to cover up these sharp edges on the rod. Now I'm going to give the bore a healthy coating of oil so that when I do push the piston and rod into the engine they slide down nice and easy. Now remember the dot faces the front of the engine. Now I'm going to grab my ring compressor which I've also oiled up on the inside to ease it to slide into the bore. Make sure a little bit of the piston skirt is sticking out of the bottom. Now the important thing is, is to make sure that the piston ring compressor is completely flat with the block and it stays flat with the block. If it lifts at all, a ring could pop out between the compressor and the block 
and you'll probably snap the ring. So hold it nice and tight and tap it down and it'll start to go tighter and give it a solid hit. Now to flip it back over. Now the sharp bits of the rod are out of the ball. I can take my protective packet off. And then I can give the big end of the crank a little bit of assembly loop. And from the bottom, guide the piston up and make sure the rod doesn't catch on anything on the crank. Now I can grab the cap for the rod. The numbers are on this side and on the rod the numbers are on this side. So making sure it's going the right way round. It already has the bearing installed and some assembly lube. Now for the bolts. These Max Peden rods do come with ARP bolts and it is suggested to use a little bit of ARP lubricant before putting these in. Now they didn't come with the lubricant so I bought some myself. It's cheap enough for a big packer. Now before I talk them down, I'm just going to nip them up by hand, very gently, going little by little, side to side, to pull it down nice and evenly. Now Max Piedenrod, believe it or not, actually suggests to torque these to 26 to 28 foot-pounds. I didn't believe it myself but I did have to research a lot to make sure this was right as it's such a small amount. So I'm going to do this in stages. I'm going to go 10 foot pound, 20 foot pound and then 27 foot pound. Now before I go any further, I want to make sure this engine still turns over by hand so that nothing's fouled up and nothing's touching where it shouldn't be touching. Nice and smooth, on to the next one. Thank <laughs> you.
the last thing I'm going to put on is little oil squirts that go deep down in the block here. Now, some people choose to put these in first, but I chose to put them in last and sort of struggle with it. My theory was that if I put these in first, because they hook into the barrel of the piston, there was a chance that I could catch the rod or the piston on these and damage these or the rods or pistons. So I'd rather struggle with them last. The bolt that holds them in is a banjo bolt and this doesn't need any copper washers or anything. I'm just going to put a little bit of oil on it, put it in and slide it in. These are only torqued up to 18 newton meters so don't go crazy. After all they are just a banjo bolt and they do have a little locating lug on the bottom that locates in a hole in the block. What I'm going to do is these two first as the crank is in a position where I could get to them, rotate it over and do one and four. Well, that is the rotating assembly all buttoned up. If this video helped you to build your bottom end, leave a comment down below. Catch me in the next episode when I've got more exciting stuff to bolt to this engine. Don't forget to like and subscribe.